Matthew chapter 5 today, uh, it's Jesus speaking one of the most famous speeches ever given. It's referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 5, starting uh, verses 1 through you know, 10, you'll, or 3 through 10, you're going to find the Beatitudes. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who are, are, are mistreated for my sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want you to understand what this is saying. Jesus is saying that you will, as my followers, face persecution in this life. And I think that in 2021, we're seeing some of that kind of ramp up as people are saying, anybody who doesn't think just like everybody else, you're going to be excluded from life and reality of everybody else. And like, what we're saying is, it's okay if we face persecution in this life because we know that our Lord and Savior himself was persecuted, and yet we know that he is going to carry us through everything. And what's interesting is right on the heels of this, he goes right into verse 13, and that's where we're going to start today. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus said it like this, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Now, the word salty here is not the word that we would use in 2021 as slang for someone who's got like an attitude, oh, she just got salty with me, Okay. No, he's actually talking about physical salt and its actual properties of being salt. And it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Okay, now what Jesus is saying is not saying that he, you're gonna be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Once again, he's just saying, if salt isn't salty anymore, you just might as well just throw it outside because it's no good. It's actually valuable in his day if it had its salty properties, but if it loses its saltiness, it's no good anymore. He says this, you're the light of the world. So he goes, he goes, you're the salt of the earth. And then he's like, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. So what he's saying is he's using two illustrations, salt and light. He's saying salt, if it's no longer salty, it's useless. Light, if it's hidden underneath a bowl, it's no longer useful. It's, it's useless. It's going to just... You're not, you're not fulfilling your purpose is what he's speaking about here. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, in the same way that salt and light need to stick to their purpose, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine. Let your light shine. Let your light shine. I've simply entitled today's message, real creative here, salt and light. Salt and light. You're gonna, you're gonna get something out of today. You ready? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence. God, your word is powerful. And God, I pray that over the next few moments that you would quicken me to hear what it is that you want to communicate and deliver your message artic articulately and effectively. God, today, God, we honor you, and we honor your word. It's in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I don't know if you've ever had something like this happen, but I'm really emotionally uh, positive and upbeat most of the time. If you see me around, I'm smiling. People call me the smiling pastor. I, just, I usually have a very good disp disp disposition, but sometimes I just kind of get down. I don't know if you've ever just felt a spirit of heaviness come over you. Woke up a few days ago and just, wow, I just felt really like down. I, I don't want to say I felt depressed, but I just felt, I mean, I knew me, I got to get in God's word. I got I to gotta get, get filled with God's word. I got to let God's word renew me. But I think that the message that we're going to speak about today is going to be one of these messages that if you deal with being down, you actually lean into your purpose, the reason why God has created you, and you're going to find yourself having a, a, a much more different outlook on life. You're not going to be struggling so much with some of those thoughts of depression and down because you're like, man, I'm on mission. I'm doing what God's called me to do. I'm fulfilling the purpose that he gave me in my life. I'm doing everything that God wants me to do, and I'm going to lean into everything that he is leading me to do. 
Last week, we had a missionary come and share, and at the end, he was down at the table out in the atrium. I was standing there next to him, and it was so cool to see all the people lined up to talk to him. You can just see the heart of our church and for missions. People were just lined up to wait just so that they could speak to him for a few moments, get a prayer card from him, because they were excited about the mission that God had sent him on. And one young woman walked up to him, and she said, oh, I was so inspired by your, by your message today. Thank you so much. She said, I got one question for you, though. Remember, I'm standing right here. And she says, how do you share the gospel with somebody? How do you, like, tell them about Jesus? And I, like, leaned over to her because I got a friendship with her, and I was like, hey, you're kind of, like, getting me in trouble here, you know? Like, that's kind of my job is to get you to know how to do that, you know? And we got into it. She knew how to do it. She was just asking for his method. What does he do when he's overseas and things like that? But listen, that's what we're here to do. And I wanna answer that question. In fact, I thought it was so interesting that she had said that one week before I knew that I was gonna be bringing this message to you. So what I want to walk away from today is I want you to know not only that you are inspired to share the gospel with other people, but I want you to know how to do it. So I don't wanna just get you excited about it and say, okay, now go figure it out. But I don't wanna just tell you all the root and routine and all the thing and not tell you actually like the why of why we do this because it gets us excited. Jesus says that we are the salt of the earth and that we are the city on a hill that cannot be hidden. I wanna give you kind of three main ideas that we're gonna spend time on today. The first one is Jesus says that we need to do good deeds. He said, let your light shine. Do good deeds before other people so that your light can shine before them. And he uses these two illustrations of, of salt and light, talking about the way that we live our lives in front of other people that show the glory of God to them. So I want to talk about this idea of salt. I, I don't know if you and I fully understand the context of what a first century person would be thinking about when Jesus was talking about the salt of the earth. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uses for salt. I mean, salt seasons things, salt purifies things. I don't know if you've ever had your mom tell you, if you had a sore throat, to gargle with salt water. It has healing properties to it. It cleanses things. It keeps things pure and clean. You can have a salt water pool that you can swim in. But here's the idea that Jesus was referring to here in the first century mindset, is that salt preserves things. Salt has the properties that you can actually take a piece of meat that has been cooked and that you can preserve it for weeks, even months, without it decaying when you pack it in salt. And this was very important to a first century person because salt had such value because of this preserving quality about it. In fact, Roman soldiers would actually get paid in salt. Have you ever heard the phrase, you're not worth your salt? Well, they would actually get paid in salt. The, the Latin word for salary is salarium. It's where we get our English word salary from, and it was what the Roman soldiers would receive. They would receive a salarium, a, a gift of salt, and that would be the payment that they had because they'd have to go on long voyages, long journeys. They'd fight in wars that would be clear way over, away from Italy. It'd be in like Egypt somewhere. And they would pack all of their needed supplies in salt and they would carry it with them and they wouldn't starve to death on the journey and when they're on the battlefield because they had all of their needs preserved. Here's what's important about preservation. Jesus says that you and I are the salt of the earth. Did you know that we as Christians filled with the spirit of God, we preserve the earth. As soon as we're raptured out of here, as soon as we're taken away to be with the Lord forever in the air, immediately the world is gonna go into a state of decline and decay because the salt's gonna be gone. The Christians are gonna be gone. We're holding back the wrath of God from coming to the earth today because God has a mission for us to reach every human being with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as soon as we're taken away from here, the preservation's gonna be gone. We're like Old Testament prophets. They preserved the nation of Israel. They came sometimes under heavy persecution and they said, this is the word of the Lord. You need to repent. You need to change this. You've been going away from God here. That's what we do. We bring the word of the Lord in the power of the spirit of the Lord and we preserve the earth today. We preserve the things around us. 
I had an in, in occurrence about 20 years ago. I couldn't believe it was so long ago. I spent a short-term missions project in the nation of Barbados. It's an island nation. I was there for about six months, and one of the things that they ate there I'd never seen or experienced or tasted in my life, and it was, they called it salt fish. And they'd cook a piece of fish, and then they'd just pack it in salt. I mean, just bury the thing in a mound of salt, and they'd keep it like in the pantry, like they wouldn't refrigerate it, and then whenever you wanted to eat it, you just pull it out, like brush all the salt off, and then you'd, you'd begin to eat the meat, and it would stay good for a long time, but... Boy, was it salty. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had like a salt shaker just like open up on you and just dump all the salt on your food and you're like, gotta throw that out. No, they're like, that's what we're gonna use to preserve our food, you know? Because it has this preservation quality about it, has the ability to keep something longer than it should last. You and I in the earth bringing the word of the Lord in the spirit's power is preserving the world around us. We can't shrink back from this culture. Uh, Jesus never told us, hey, when things get really bad, go buy a bunch of food and build an underground bunker and make sure that you got all the weapons that you're gonna need to fight the zombie apocalypse. He says... Go be the salt of the earth. A city on a hill, shining light to everyone in the house. We are to preach the gospel to everybody, everywhere for as long as we can. And when our time is up, our time is up. But we're not gonna shrink back in fear. We are the salt of the earth. God's called us to something. We've got an amazing purpose. Not only that, he says, you're the salt of the earth. And he says, you're the light of the world. And then he says, in the same way, let your light shine before men so that they might see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. I want you to hear this. He says, your light will shine and people will see your good deeds and then they're gonna glorify God. So translated, could read, they're going to see your good deeds and they're going to see God. I want you to think about this for a moment. The only way for people to experience the power and the presence of God is through the church. And you are the church. I am the church. And so for anybody to see God in any way, they have to see him through us. We are the window that people get to view God through. We are the only window that people are gonna view God through. They're never gonna see God in any other way other than through you. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Now, let me get a little nerdy with you for a second. I'm gonna bring up a diagram here, and this is gonna show you the electromagnetic spectrum of energy, okay? Now get this, right here. This, I know it's a lot to take in. This is the spectrum right here. Oh, here, let me go back here. Oh, I went forward, here we go, okay. Now, this is the spectrum of light, and this is, come on, Jeremiah, what is going on with you? Okay, don't touch the TV. Back away a little bit. (laughs) This is the sliver of visible light. So there's tons of energy that's here, but the only place that you can see the energy is through this little tiny rainbow that you see right here, and that's what comes out into this big bar right here. But you can see, this is just a tiny amount. In fact, this is not even to scale. I mean, this is super long, and the window of visible light is just tiny, minuscule. Now, let me kind of break this down for you. This is cosmic rays and gamma rays and x-rays, ultraviolet rays. All those are bad things, right? I mean, cosmic rays, dude, if a cosmic ray got you, boom, you're gone. You're disintegrated. You're dust. You're not even dust. You're you got cosmic rayed, okay? I mean, it is like significantly bad. Gamma rays is what turned the Hulk green and huge. Bad news, Oh, x-rays, you know, you go get an x-ray done, like the technician hides behind the wall, you know, and like they put a big leather or a, a, a lead vest on you, you know, you're like, ah, you know, do the whole thing. Ultraviolet, you gotta rub all that sunscreen on so that you don't get burned out there. These are all pretty dangerous situations right over here, but they're becoming increasingly safer as then you get to this nice land of visible light. Oh, it's so great, so healthy, so good. Then you got infrared. Infrared is like, you know, remote control to the TV, infrared, microwaves. We have microwaves in our house and we're not like blowing up radar, radio, broadcast band waves. I mean, they're all over the place right now. 5G is like right in here somewhere, you know. So, I mean, that's, that's what's going on. But, but visible light is just this little tiny sliver. Let, let, me, let me illustrate it like this. 
God is everywhere. He is all spectrums. He is everywhere at all times. The psalmist says, if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I ride on the wings of the dawn, you are there. You cannot go anywhere and escape the presence of God, but God has limited the spiritual sight for believers and unbelievers alike to only see God through us. We are the multicolored rainbow of people in the room from every walk of life, and we all reflect the glory of God. We're created in the image of God to shine light. But here's the thing. The only way that people get to encounter God is through you. It's through you. You are the visible spectrum of God's energy around the world. It's the only way. People aren't going to find out any other way. They're only going to find out through you living your light out in front of people. It's essential that we do it. We don't hide under a bowl. We don't kind of just be like, well, I'm just going to wait till them to figure out. You know what some people do? They go, I hope people at work don't find out I'm a Christian. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? Like, This is the purpose you have in life. It's the only real thing that's ever gonna last. You can't take anything with you to heaven except for more people. That's it. That's the only thing that, everything that you think is important in life, gone. Your career, your education. I mean, your saving, like it's all vanished. It's gone. It's disappearing. It's not gonna last. Moth and rust are gonna destroy and thieves are gonna break in and steal. Like, you cannot take it with you except the people, the souls that God puts in our path, the people that we should, and we need to be a city on a hill. We need to be a shining light, an example. In the book of Philippians chapter two, Paul says it like this. He says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Man, it's like he knows us. Warped and crooked generation. That's exactly where we live here. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. I kind of feel like it's like a, it's like a, like I'm, a, I'm a water skiing, right? I'm holding on to the word of life and I'm saying, come on, everybody. Following Jesus is amazing. He'll rescue you from drowning. <laughs> He'll save you. Let's go. But we're here to shine. That's, that's what we're, but he says, he says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. What he's saying is do good, do good deeds, do good deeds. That's what he's saying. He goes on to say this in uh, Ephesians chapter two. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Why are we doing this? We're doing it so that other people can see Jesus. They see the light of God through our lives, and that's the only way, and it's so important for us to do good things consistently. And if you're complaining and arguing about stuff, that you put that away, surrender it to the cross, say, God, I'm not gonna do that anymore, and I'm gonna walk in the goodness that you've called me to. Other people are getting nasty on social media, and you drop down to the comments, and you're like, oh, they didn't say that. But you don't say that. You can secretly just kind of delight in comments. I mean, as a pastor, that's, that's what I do. I can't really get out there and be all, so I just kind of be like, oh, they got it, you know? What we're doing is we're shining the light of God in everything that we do and everything that we say. One of of the greatest ways to illustrate this is to look at the letter that Peter wrote to the early church. Now, Peter was writing this letter because the church was undergoing severe persecution. And when I mean persecution, I mean like they're getting killed, okay? There, There was an evil emperor at the time and he was actually using Christians as torches to light up the street at night people. He was burning people. It was was Christians, and and it was serious, and the church is frightened. They're afraid. They don't know what to do. They're going to prayer meetings. They're reading the letters that the uh, apostles are writing, and and Peter says this to the church that's being persecuted, and and he just talked about the persecution they were going through. He said, who's going to harm you? Because he was just talking about all the harm they were going through, but he says, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Once again, do good deeds. Let your light shine. But even if you should suffer for what's right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Verse 15 is the key. But in your hearts, 
revere Christ as Lord. Set apart Christ as Lord. Say, God, you're God over my life. You're Lord over my life. This is not my life. You bought me with a price. Now I'm here. I'm going I'm to honor you with my body. I'm going to do everything that I can to glorify you. And he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Think about this. You're persecuting someone. You're not a Christian. You're, you're, you're preparing to burn them if that's what the emperor told you to do. You're tying them up. You're just obeying the order that your military advisor gave you. You're tying this guy up. And man, he is just hopeful, singing songs, speaking in hymns and spiritual songs to his friends. And man, you're like, tell me how you are hope. You realize I'm about to burn you, right? You understand the, the ramifications of our do good in the midst of things bad being done to us. It glorifies God. It just shines the light of God everywhere. Peter says, you've got to always be prepared to give an answer. Are you prepared? Are you prepared to give an answer? I'm not saying, are you prepared to be persecuted? I'm just saying, are you prepared that when you have hope exuding out of your life, when there's a moment when everyone else is showing no signs of hope, are you able to give an answer? Are you prepared? The word prepared here, it means ready, willing, and equipped. Are you ready, willing, and equipped to give an answer to everyone who asks about your hope? I want you to be, and I'm gonna tell you how to be ready and prepared. Peter is saying in this passage, you need to know what to say. You need to know who your hope is, because your hope is the person of Jesus. Your hope is not a set of circumstances that are going to work out in your favor. Your, your hope is not your prayers being answered. Your prayer is the person of Jesus who is saving your soul from hell and damnation and giving you eternal life. Your hope is a person. And he says you need to know how to respond to the questions that people ask you. And so I wanna do that right now. I wanna dig into this. The second thing, the second big idea I wanna talk to you, I'm gonna run through the rest of this stuff right here. The second big idea is that we need to ask good questions. We need to ask good questions. We need to learn how to talk to other people about the things that we're going through and how we can give them the answer for the hope that we have. Mike Holt says it like this in his book, Inside Out. If we would learn to ask good questions and become good listeners, we will greatly influence people with the gospel. See, it's real easy to turn a natural conversation into a spiritual conversation through the way that we ask good questions. Let me say it like this. You're talking to somebody, they're not a believer. You're saying, hey, how's your kids doing right now? Oh, yeah, they're, they're finally going back to school that second week of April, and you know, I'm a little nervous, I'm a little hesitant. I know that they got some social distancing and stuff, but I'm just, I'm just afraid. And you say, wow, how do, you, how do you deal with fear when fear comes up? Asking good questions. Oh, I, I don't really know. I, I just, sometimes I eat, sometimes I call a friend, sometimes I do this. You know, you know what I like to do? Flip it to the spiritual. I like to pray whenever I have fear come over my life. Oh, immediately it's like, okay. Uh, that conversation could go anywhere from there. All of a sudden, now you're ready to present the gospel to them. All of a sudden, now you're ready to take that natural conversation and just flip it to a spiritual conversation. And you don't have to make it weird. It doesn't have to be spooky or kooky. You don't have to come up with an evangel cube. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these. They got like little tools and tracks and stuff like that. that you, you can use those if you want to. But you can just make it natural. You can just make it normal and just make it interject. Like my faith is like a part of my everyday life and I'm just gonna tell you how I live. I'm gonna tell you about the hope that I have. I'm gonna tell you about the person of Jesus and what he's done for me and how he can help you whatever you're going through. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to know that sharing the gospel with someone, of telling them the good news about Jesus, it doesn't have to be something that you feel like you're coerced and forced to do. You're bending your arm behind your back and you're like, you're twisting my arm, okay, I'll do it. Pastor's talking about preaching the gospel. I gotta go witness to people. That means whenever I go to Meyer and I'm standing at the checkout, I gotta be like, do you know Jesus? Are you going to heaven? <laughs> Sometimes the Lord might want you to do that, but I tend to find that people are more receptive whenever there's a moment where they take notice of the hope that we have in our lives. The third thing and the final thing that we're gonna talk about today is to share the good news. We need to share 
the good news. We need to go out and do that. Like, we need to be a part of sharing the good news about Jesus. We need to not only do good deeds, we need to ask good questions, but we need to share the good news. You need to close the deal, okay? They're out there, they're ready to receive God's love and forgiveness in their lives, and we've got to be ready and willing to actually share the good news and tell people the gospel. How do we share the gospel? It's really simple. Mike Holt says in this book, he says, that from 1 Peter chapter three, that Jesus suffered once for sins, he was put to death in his body, and he saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And simply put, it's like this. To share the gospel, he came, he died, and he rose again. He came to the earth physically. God so loved the world that he came, he gave his life, he died, and he rose again from the dead. That's how you share the gospel. You just make sure that you cover the three bases. God came. Why did God come? Look at this. For God so loved the world. You tell people when you say he came, you say he came because he loves you. He knew that you were stuck in your sin, that you couldn't get out on your own, and there was only one way for you to be rescued. He's got to come down there and fix it himself. He, he He just knew where we were, and he came. He died. He died a sacrificial death on the cross, and he rose again. He rose again to new life. Every other religion, their leaders die, and it's over. There's no further hope. If if the leader of the religion is dead, it seems like it might not have a path that goes past our death. You might be able to be very devout in this life. You might even have very good results from practicing some other religion. It might really make you a very moral and upstanding person. I don't follow Jesus so that I can just be moral and upstanding person. I follow Jesus because he can save me from my sin. He can rescue me from death. He can bring me to life forever. Everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You tell people God loves you. He died in your place and he wants to give you eternal life. Just trust him. That's what I want to offer you right now. Can we pray right now? Can we just pray and ask God to help us? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word today. I thank you that you're speaking to Christians in this room about being the light of the world, being the salt of the earth, preaching the word of the Lord in the power of your spirit. God, that you're equipping us through this knowledge of how to engage someone, how to ask good questions and how to give the answer. And that is you. Father, I pray that you'd fill us, fill each of us, God, with a greater measure of power and anointing God, that we would be full of your spirit and be your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. God, that we could be used to carry the light of the gospel to the four corners of the earth. And God, that people will know that you are Lord. And God, in this place today, I know there may be some people under the sound of my voice that do not have a relationship with you. Father, right now, I pray that you'd let them know, inform their hearts that you so loved them that you gave your one and only son. That whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have eternal life. If you're here today and that's you and you need to put your faith in Jesus, I want you to do something really bold and courageous. In fact, I believe it's the biggest decision you'll ever make in your life. And I believe that a big decision it requires some big courage. We're not gonna embarrass you. No, we're gonna call you to the front. We're not even gonna point you out. This is between you and God, but I want you to take a step of faith today to acknowledge God's lordship over your life. And to, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to lift up your hands all across this room and online. Right now, you might be sensing a, a feeling from God that God is taking you to himself. He's, he's saying, come, come, come be my child. Enter into my kingdom. Accept my son, Jesus. Forgiveness of your sins and eternal life and a filling of the Holy Spirit in your heart. If you want that today, I want you on the count of three to lift up your hand and we're gonna pray together. Are you ready? One, two, three. All across this room. Yes, yes, 
I see those hands. I see those hands. Wonderful. Wonderful. Come on. Is there anybody else? You're just saying, save me, Jesus. Do a work in my life. Yes. Yes, you can put your hands right back down. I'd like us all to pray this prayer out loud. Let's encourage those who might be praying this for the very first time. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you came. I believe you died. And I believe you rose again. I believe that you love me. And that you're forgiving my sins. And that you're giving me eternal life. You're filling me with your spirit. And walking with me every day. I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, can we just celebrate the work of God in this place? He's so good. He's a good God. He loves us so much. Listen, if you just gave your life to Christ, text the word Jesus to the number you see right here on the screen. We want to pray with you. We want to we let you know how you can follow Jesus, some ways that you can just go forward with him and not be stuck in that place that you've been stuck with for so long.